Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Your Clinical Equipment is Talking, Are You Listening? On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through just a few quick housekeeping instructions. We will begin today's webinar with a discussion and presentation, and we'll have time at the end for an audience question and answer session. You could submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box to see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. If at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, just try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We're here to help. And with that, I am pleased to welcome today's speakers. Today, we're joined by Brad Busick, Senior Vice President, Chief Information Officer with MultiCare Health System, and Puneet Pandit. CEO and co-founder of Glass Beam. Brad and Puneet, thank you for being here today. Let's let's get into our conversation. So I'm gonna tee up the first question here. Uh, you know, smart systems and devices have been, we, we've been hearing about them for some time. Uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion there. Uh, where would you say healthcare providers are today uh, in terms of progress on this digital transformation? Brad, perhaps perhaps you can get the ball rolling here and then Puneet will, will, will turn it to you as well. Yeah, you bet. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, you know, the short answer is uh, we're all over the map. Uh, and when I say the map, uh, this is a, uh, a great depiction of um, Gartner's view of capabilities. Uh, and I think um, all of our listeners today could uh, find themselves uh, in some or all of these um, with different levels of maturity. What's consistent uh, about these capabilities is that they're all um, riding on one thing and one thing only, and that's data. So I wanna specifically call out um, the peak of inflated expectations related to IoT in, in hospitals. Uh, even though you know, Gartner has this um, heading towards kind of the trough of disillusionment, um, I actually um, would, would challenge uh, the idea that it is um, in fact uh, this early uh, in its maturity and its um, capability. Part of what MultiCare has, has been able to do is actually bring that capability forward um, jumping the slope of enlightenment all the way to the plateau uh, of productivity um, in partnership with uh, the work we've been doing with um, Glassbeam um, and Puneet's team. Uh, the fruit of which we'll talk about today um, has not us allowed us to uh, make better decisions about the equipment uh, that we um, already have, but it actually informs the type of technology expertise and staff that we need uh, to keep our uh, imaging equipment um, running at top shape, which in today's market, as you know, with the financial pressures we're facing, um, anytime that you can keep um, machines healthy it is a huge win for uh, our patient experience, um, and it also has bottom line implications. Appreciate that, Brad. Thank you so much for, for sort of tackling that question and giving us a, the, the lay of the land or at least a sense of uh, your experience with Multicare. Puneet, what would you hook on? What would you add here? Yeah, sure. I think this is a, a great uh, introduction by Brad on, on the value of data and in today's complex world of, of healthcare equipment and healthcare providers managing that uh, diverse set of equipment. Uh, as we all know, data is the new oil in terms of enabling uh, rich analytics architecture. No surprises there. Uh, but just to put a little bit more color, uh, what are we talking in terms of data? Uh, there, I would say there are three kinds of data that we really relate to in the, in the world of healthcare. The first is the machine logs, uh, which are coming out of these connected medical equipment. The second is the, the data from the patient workflows. Uh, and third is the infrastructure data, uh, infrastructure being the buildings, the facilities, or the other uh, things like compressors and HVAC units and so on and so forth. Uh, so as you can imagine, all these data types have different formats. Uh, they are multi-structured, they are complex, uh, and therein lies the challenge. Uh, and, and that's what Brad said that this is a, a peak of inflated expectations because people are really eager to ingest all these different data types and make sense of that through some kind of a magic uh, cube and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and that's where I think uh, companies like uh, Glass Team or, or any, any analytics company, uh, you know, we can take that data, put that through a, a process where we can extract the business value uh, and, and move forward. Now, uh, with that said, you know, the, the business case and the use cases are really around two pieces. One is the increasing machine uptime. Uh, 
uh, and second is the uh, value of the, uh, the machine uh, utilization across the entire fleet. But we'll touch on these topics in the subsequent slides. I just wanted to uh, put more color on what Brad said. Thank you. Thank you for that, Puneet. Uh, and now I want to ask, you know, from each of your perspective, what are some of the, the key components here to really facilitating this digital transformation? And I also want to ask how organizations, particularly those with sort of existing infrastructures here, kind of get started on, on executing this transformation. Brad, perhaps we can throw it back to you again to get the ball rolling. Yeah, thank you. You know, the short answer is um, the, the easiest way to do it is to just start. And uh, there's a few areas of uh, investment where specifically multi-care is looking ahead to, you know, the future of care. Um, of course, the future of care is, is built on uh, previous learnings uh, and the shoulders that we're already standing on. And so I want to focus on a couple of areas uh, where we actually feel like digital transformation is already underway. <laughs> But how it manifests itself um, is in the eye of the beholder. So whether that's a centralized uh, command center that's looking over your entire system saying, hey, we might have capacity over at uh, Allen Moore Hospital um, versus uh, Good Sam. Let's go ahead and transfer you know, these 30 patients here um, all the way to what we're doing right now with um, utilizing Starlink. Uh, for uh, internet capabilities um, in a place where there you know, is still dial up um, or DSL. Um, when you take that type of approach, you know, frankly, our, our patients don't care. Uh, they want quality care uh, that speaks to them when they need it. And so digital transformation um, isn't for the sake of digital transformation. The so that is so that our customers receive uh, the best possible care that they can. In support of all of that, even referenced on the previous slide, every one of these capabilities is riding on the platform of data. So as Puneet mentioned, when we talk about things like um, RFID or even CMMS integration, how do you seamlessly integrate your HVAC system with your ticketing system so that you have the right tech at the right place at the right time? Or how do you utilize um, autonomous robots uh, to allow your nurses to be at the bedside um, and free up um, and get, get rid of the non-value added tasks that they're currently performing, whether that is um, fetching equipment from one place to another um, and or you know retrieving um, lost, uh, lost items. We'd rather have our nurses be at the bedside. To, to take advantage of these uh, with any um, level of, uh, of integrity, you're making decisions based on the data that you have. And so for us, uh, while we wanna talk about the digital transformation that's, that's underway, um, the truth is uh, if you haven't started this, you're already behind. And um, in partnership uh, with Glassbeam, we've been able to take the first uh, step towards uh, data-driven decision-making around some of our most expensive assets. Uh, so tying this back to the command center work, uh, it is not out of the realm of possibility that a system has a network operations center that's monitoring your imaging fleet, whether it's an MRI or a CT, or even better, um, your HVAC systems, your boilers and your chillers, all the stuff that nobody cares about until it breaks uh, to proactively engage, repair um, and mitigate risk um, in support of a better customer experience. And so that's that's how we think about it. That's how we talk about it. And, and frankly, that's where we're investing. Appreciate that, Brad. And, and Puni, what would you add here, uh, you know, specifically thinking around some of the, the workflow uh, components of this that, that Brad laid out? What would you what would you add? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the few things that I would uh, really uh, hone in on is, uh, let's take the example of real-time location services, RTLS. Now the world of RTLS historically uh, has been leveraged by the providers in the context of asset tracking and understanding where the equipment might be at a particular point in time. And that's great, but I think moving forward, RTLS can also be used to monitor patient workflows. And so you can now understand from point A to point B to point C as a patient comes in and does the registration then walks into an exam room, exam is done, and then the discharge happens. You know, what's happening in that different, you know, point A, point B, point C, what, what are the delays? Uh, how long is that uh, workflow uh, taking uh, in one facility versus second facility? And you can start benchmarking. 
And now you can start finding operational gaps or operational improvements that you can start making. The end goal being, how can you get more patients? How can you do more exams? And how can you increase revenues? Of course, you know, delivering better patient care. So that's a great example of how RTLS is, is, is evolving from asset tracking into more patient workflow optimization techniques. Uh, and similar to that, there's other kinds of things happening uh, as an example on, uh, let's say, CMS integration. Now, CMS integration means from the world of uh, analytics programs, you can start mining the data, all the service ticket data historically being stored in these systems for the last you know, one or two years and convert all the reactivity that's happening in, from a support perspective into more proactive and predictive notifications. So now you're building a knowledge base all in the cloud in an analytics uh, where, you know, uh, powerhouse like Glassbeam in this case, and, and basically making your entire workflow much more smarter in terms of solving cases, uh, or even before cases open up, you solve the problem because case doesn't need to be opened up. So there are a lot of such technologies that are actually going to the next level in improving the whole world of patient care from analytics perspective. I appreciate that. And and looking at this sort of um, ecosystem of, of solutions we have here, I, I think we have to sort of speak to the, the discussion about the lack of standards of interoperability across platforms. And I'm going to ask each of you to share your perspective on, on this with, with our attendees today. Puneet, maybe we can have you kick things off this time. Then, then Brad, you can jump in as well. Absolutely. Um, so I think the interop challenges in terms of like i said on the on the, on the first slide uh the data types are so diverse uh they are multi-structured they are coming from different endpoints different protocols um the ingestion speeds are different some sometimes data is streaming sometimes it's a batch data uh so the challenge uh in interop is that how do you tackle all these different endpoints with different kinds of characteristics into one single unified ingestion engine, data ingestion engine. And while the data is being ingested, how do you parse it? How do you extract meaning from that data? How do you apply rules? How do you apply machine learning techniques and take action, right? So if you look at the whole data engineering pipeline from again, point zero to, you know, going from A to Z, it's a pretty complex problem. And so uh, doing that, and many, many companies actually, we have seen they try and do this sometimes in-house as a build versus buy, debate that, oh, you know, we, we can use open source technologies uh, and, and start building this kind of a data engineering pipeline with our IT resources, it becomes a nightmare. It becomes a nightmare in the context of, you know, hiring and building teams. And then by the time you finish the project, the data formats have changed, use cases have changed, and therefore, you know, uh, you need to start evolving towards a, a more sophisticated program. Again, in this case, companies like Glassbeam are the, the at the forefront of building those kind of programs and analytic solutions where you can deploy this interop solution uh, in a far, far, you know, far, uh, I uh, if I may say that uh, from a time to market standpoint is much, much higher. So at a lower cost, time to market is much higher when you deploy a solution with a, with a, with a platform like Glassbeam. I appreciate Brad, that. Go, go, go ahead, Brad. I, I'd love to hear from you too, as well on the, 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 you know, the, the real health system perspective here, if you could, you could share a bit about your experience. Yeah. I mean, the real healthcare um, perspective uh, is, is actually worse than Puneet uh, describes um, the, the lack of standards um, and, you know, frankly, the secret sauce to get these systems to talk um, is a little bit of a superpower. And part of uh, the challenge with this is that, uh, you're you're really fighting the uh, digital uh, native platforms, um, cloud-based platforms, um, pitting those against legacy platforms that are on-prem that were never really built to talk. And so you've got this really, really cool panacea of capabilities that are tied to the anchors of systems that are trying to catch up. And in between that tension is, uh, you know, a war for talent. And Again, back to my previous point, the patient doesn't care. They just want to be able to have a single system to log into. They want to be able to see all their records, whether it's pathology, the outcome of their CT scan, their labs. They actually want to be able to pay their bill online. Oh, and by the way, 
when I go make an appointment for, um, you know, mammography, I don't want to hear that my appointment's been rescheduled because the imaging machine is down. So it's our job to not do it the way that we've always done it, which is let's just wait for the machine to break and fix it. Rather, can we prevent the machine from breaking at all? And, and that's the difference. And then if we actually can do that and we find out how to extract that telemetry, how do we take that into a model um, that starts to develop patterns? It gives my technicians who are experts in this space the ability to make data-driven decisions as opposed to you know, holding their ear up to the machine saying, yeah, you know, that fan's running a little bit harder than it should be. So it, it moves us from insights into actions, which um, I, I love. Uh, and I'm actually really, really excited about uh, the market um, and, and the new capability that glass beams have been able to crack here with taking this data and actually doing something with it. Thank you, Brad. And the, the next question I want to ask then for folks out there at, at organizations that might be thinking about uh, really engaging on this journey or even in sort of the nascent stages of this journey, planning stages of this journey, what are some key considerations those folks should really be keeping in mind? Puni, what would you say to that? I think the uh, if you look at the 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 number of options that are available in this realm, as you can see on the slide, uh, you know, there's patient imaging equipment, there's patient monitoring equipment, there's lab equipment, there's facilities, there's buildings. I think that the key consideration here, uh, if I'm seeing on as a CFO in a C-suite in a healthcare provider institution, is where's the biggest bang for the buck? Where do I get the maximum ROI uh, from these kind of analytics solutions or implementation programs? So if I'm investing, for example, uh, if I'm investing a million dollars over three years uh, into this kind of program, uh, I would want to have at least a three to four times ROI. So how do I get that three to four million dollars as, uh, uh, as a benefit from uh, hard benefits and soft benefits from this program. So I think those, that's the that's the main consideration from any uh, business person in this in this discussion. Uh, and if I may just add on to that with an example, uh, I, I think the the biggest bang for the buck that we have seen so far uh, from an analytics company perspective is if you focus on patient imaging equipment, which is the most expensive equipment at the end of the day, you know, it costs like one or two or three, four million dollars, depending on the kind of you know, MR, CDs or cath labs. Uh, they, these machines are also generating most of the revenues at the end of the day uh, from an imaging perspective in these healthcare institutions. So if these machines go down as the unplanned on times, you lose revenues, you also disrupt patient care, uh, and there's many other down cascading uh, you know, uh, issues that start happening in that, in that context. And so if you focus on just the imaging equipment install base and start applying analytics programs to provide higher machine uptime or better utilization of the fleet, you can start getting a significant ROI from such programs. And Brad can elaborate further because that's one of the initiatives that we are working at Multicare right now with him. Yeah, thanks, Puneet. Um, we're, we're seeing that in, in real time. Um, more than ever, uh, the pressures for uh, technology solutions to provide a tangible value um, is, uh, is real, and we, we're facing it. Um, Puneet referenced earlier um, speed to market. Uh, I, no longer can I go deploy a solution and, and have to wait two years for it to have a payback period, um, or worse, have a, you know, a negative um, NPV. So in all of that, as a decision maker, I'm looking for a solution that not only uh, does what it says it's going to do um, in support of a better patient experience, uh, but actually um, pays for itself. And uh, as we are been on this journey with with Glassbeam, I'm more excited to, to say that we are doing that and, and we'll continue to do that and are investing further. Um, the only other thing that I'll add to this, Brian, in terms of your question of how do you, you know, how do you start? Uh, you need to actually find a partner um, that does this for a living. I, I will say that healthcare um, writ large um, rarely has this expertise in house. Uh, and the market is flooded with a lot of uh, players that claim to be able to do this. And so um, just given my background, we were able to cut through the noise quickly, find a use case, um, try it on. And of course it, it um, panned out as expected. Uh, and then we continued uh, to invest further. 
appreciate that, Brad. Thank you, Puneet, as well. And, and I guess the next question I want to ask, and, and Brad, I'd actually be curious to hear what you have to say on this first. Um, how do you really see this market evolving? Uh, in, in particular, really thinking from the, the healthcare provider perspective, what do they really, what do these folks really need to be thoughtful about? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I will say that the uh, the pressure is is higher than ever. Uh, and what's interesting is that spending uh, is uh, not at the levels that it should be for um, infrastructure uh, and for IT capabilities. Um, on average, right now, we know that IT spending is is less than three percent of um, operating expense. And we also know that, to Panit's point earlier, the things that um, nobody cares about until they break are often the most expensive. So these are your building automation systems. These are your CTs, your MRIs, your cath lab equipment, boilers, chillers, all the stuff on a roof. Uh, we also know that patient comfort is something that is uh, at an all time high. That's actually one of the competitive advantages uh, for a hospital. Meaning if it gets hot in a hospital, a patient will complain more about that than the quality of the food because they're, they're in a bed and they can't move. Uh, and most systems that we've been exposed to um, has not invested in those capabilities to bring their systems up to par. Uh, Multicare has taken a different approach. Um, not only have we invested in that infrastructure, we actually think it's part of our um, competitive advantage and uh, are fortunate to have uh, a CEO council and board that also understands that um, further investment is needed uh, in technology that's enabling amazing patient care. And so that's that's the approach that we've taken over the last two years while we're trying to tie together um, how do we how do we get our systems to talk to each other? How do we leverage more automation so that I'm not having to hire 20 more people, um, but do this in a really thoughtful um, and, and economic way. Thank you, Brad. And Pani, what would you add there? What would you build on? Um, so first of all, I think I, I want to come in multi-care as an organization to be really progressive organization with Brad's leadership, thinking about all these, you know, trends and issues and, and latching on to uh, the, the analytics programs. Um, now, having said that, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say something which is actually very counter to uh, our, our go-to-market pitch as a company today, because we are heavily focused on AI, ML, uh, artificial intelligence solutions uh, on machine data. Uh, I, I do want to say that market is overhyped on AI ML in, in many parts of uh, parts of the business uh, as, as we are going to uh, the healthcare institutions. Uh, when I say overhyped, what I mean is that it's a buzzword. A lot of, lot of uh, providers like to hear that. Uh, and that's great. Uh, there's no question AI ML can provide a crystal ball looking into the future and, and start providing predictions on machine failures and all that great stuff. But I think there's so much low hanging fruit in terms of business impact in the world of connected equipment in the healthcare institutions where, uh, you know, you believe it or not, uh, the people are willing to accept the 97% or 98% machine uptime in many cases. Now, Glassbeam as a company has come from a data center DNA and we are used to a five nines, uh, which is 99.999% uptime which equates to like two minutes of downtime per asset per year. In the world of healthcare, you're talking, people are happily accepting uh, 60, 70 hours of downtime per machine per year. And a lot of that gap can be actually closed with just basic you know, troubleshooting on reactive support. You can apply simple rules. If X equals Y or this threshold process certain value, raise an alert and go and solve that problem. And many times those that low hanging fruit can really move an organization from reactive to proactive. Uh, now, I'm not discounting the predictive part of the equation. I'm just saying that just the first phase of going from reactive to proactive is a huge win for many, many such customers out there. So overall, I think uh, we see a, an, a huge untapped market potential, a huge trend for the future for the next five years or 10 years where we can help healthcare institutions uh, move from being reactive to proactive and ultimately being predictive for with AI. No question about that. Appreciate your, your candor there, Puneet. And, and I want to hear then what, what role you really feel like analytics companies sort of play in driving this, this, this digital transformation. Can you speak to that? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if you if you look at a, a very simplistic way of uh, three facets of analytics, uh, the first one is the machines, which is I said earlier, the machine log data. The second is the people, which is the patients and the and the workforce that is moving around uh, in different workflows and taking care of the patients. And third is the facilities, which is where all these machines and people are moving around and that's powering the entire infrastructure so that it's, it's humming and, and running well. In these three facets, machines, people, and facilities, there are different kinds of data that is pouring out. Now that data also, uh, has to be, of course, you know, well understood, parsed, and put that into a right data structure and, and mine and all that stuff. Uh, and there lies the challenges. The challenges, as you can see here, uh, I think there are three challenges. I think Brad kind of alluded to that. The first one is uh, most of the healthcare institutions, they are, their core business is taking care of the patients. Their core business is not to build analytics programs or the platforms or the applications um, and, and, and make sense out of that uh, or, or you know, trying to become more proactive or predictive. Um, the, the second piece is <clears throat> even if you decide to go down that path of building this solution in-house, um, the, the, the skill sets required to build that solution and making sure those skill sets are nurtured the right way is also a huge challenge, especially in, in today's economy where uh, you know, large companies like you know, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, all these companies are, are luring away some of the brightest talent. Uh, it, is, it is a tough market to hire you know, some really good people to, who, who can build these kind of programs. And third is, of course, the huge challenge of the interop that we just talk, talked of earlier. So I, I think analytics companies like Glassbeam coming into the forefront are solving these three challenges for, for machine data, for the workflow data around people, and the other infrastructure data that we can ingest and take that into the cloud. And, and, and that, that's really the holy grail of moving forward for, for such uh, programs. And Brad, then what would you uh, add to this, uh, the, you know, the thinking about the value of partnership here? Yeah, without the partners um, in most organizations, it doesn't happen. Um, I'm really, really you know, blessed to have an amazing uh, data orchestration and um, analytics team here. Uh, but here in the Pacific Northwest, we have some of the biggest players uh, in the world uh, between Microsoft and uh, this little company called Amazon. And so as we think about talent, um, we have more data coming at us than we've ever had. We need people to help through partnerships, take that data and move it from raw data uh, into insights. And so it's those conclusions uh, that um, have led us to better outcomes at Multicare with our partnership with Glassbeam. And uh, well, that's why we're doubling down and um, rolling it out um, even further across uh, the system and, and even becoming part of our um, M&A strategy moving forward. Excellent. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Puneet. It, it's really been a pleasure walking through uh, the, these questions and the, this topic with each of you today. Um, before we move to audience q and I just want to ask each of you for any final thoughts or, or advice for organizations, sort of, again, from, from the perspective of, of organizations really approaching this or maybe are in the midst of, of this kind of transformation. Brad, perhaps we can start with you. Yeah, uh, my, you know, final thoughts for um, you know the team that's um, listening uh, to this live. Uh, it can actually be really intimidating uh, to think about um, you know where you start, and uh, if you haven't started yet, um, or even if you're you know exploring and taking steps down this this path, we know that uh, automation um, is part of the uh, you know equation, if you will, for scalability. And uh, in a time where we're being asked to do more with the same, or in some cases less, uh, th this is actually uh, a really, really wise investment to start to think about uh, making data-driven investments um, in the platforms that you pick, in the resources that you hire, and the partners uh, that you choose. And so uh, that has been our philosophy as we go to market, not only with Glassbeam for you know uh, some of our critical equipment and, and our building automation systems, uh, but writ large uh, as, we, uh, as we invest because the need is greater than um, the resources that we have. And so uh, it makes sense to be really smart uh, through partnerships that are aligned both culturally uh, with values 
uh, and mission, um, but also execution. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Puni, what would you add? What do you, what do you want to share before we move to the Q and A? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so I think I will summarize again some of the opening remarks uh, at the start of the presentation that I made. Uh, you know, data is is the new new oil. Data is the new frontier where you have to draw deeper insights in any business, especially in the world of healthcare. Uh, from our perspective, data should become the lifeblood of the new healthcare economy to drive better patient care. Uh, and this data is, is complex data, it's multi-structured data from different endpoints. It's living in different silos inside uh, healthcare machines, facilities and patient workflows as we just discussed. So I think honestly at this point in time, it's, it's time to shine light on this dark data that's sitting in silos. Uh, and it's, it's time for healthcare organizations to uh, come forward, uh, you know, organizations like Multicare to become more progressive in the thinking, become more innovative, become more bold and embark on this journey. And, and I think whoever's embarked on this journey uh, really is gonna start differentiating their offerings in the market and provide uh, better patient care at the lowest possible cost. Appreciate that, Puneet. And, and Brad, thank you again. Uh, it, it's been a great pleasure speaking with both of you today. Well, now I'll, I'll now pass it over to my colleague, Molly Gamble, to lead the audience Q&A. Thank you, everyone. All right. And actually, we had some things come up. So uh, I will be subbing in for Molly, but we've got some great questions. Uh, so we'll go ahead and dive in. Uh, first one we've got. Given all the CAPEX priorities in a health system like mine, our uh, question asker, how do I get started? Convince my peers it's a priority. I think this one goes to Brad. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I guess I'd answer that um, in a, maybe a provocative way. Uh, I don't know that you can afford not to. Um, the conversation with our CFO and our CEO council really was around the idea of um, total cost of ownership. And if you think about the, the extensive costs associated with imaging equipment um, and your building automation systems, if you can articulate a, a relatively quick payback period for an investment um, such as Glassbeam, there aren't that many sure things in the world of technology as everybody on this call knows. And um, this has been exactly that. And so the conversation really um, moved from, hey, you know, convince me why this business justification matters to, wow, how do we actually roll this out to, you know, some of our partners and use this in some of our merger and acquisition conversations? All right, perfect. Thank you, Brad. Uh, next question we got. There is a lot of discussion out there on data ownership and right to repair. What is your position? I believe this goes to Puneet. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, uh, let me, let me handle that. Uh, it's, it's a great question and a great debate. Um, I personally faced that question a number of times in, in, in the customer discussions. Uh, and I think there's honestly, there's a confusion about who really owns the data. And I'm, when I say data being in, in the context of the medical machines. Uh, I think everyone understands the data which has been rated through patient care, like exams and other stuff, like the patient data is owned, of course, by the patient or the healthcare institution. But I think in this case, operational logs, which are sitting on the machines, uh, which tell you about the health and status and the usage of the machines, is in our perspective, absolutely owned by the healthcare providers, uh, not by the OEMs. Uh, and I think that's where the confusion is, that sometimes uh, there's a little bit uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt, uh, for, uh, thrown around in these discussions by large uh, manufacturers saying, you know, this is our machine and our data, but it's not. Uh, you know, the, when, when a healthcare provider purchases these machines, uh, the machines belong to that, uh, that healthcare provider. Uh, the operational logs sitting on those machines that are constantly being generated are owned by the provider, and they have all the right in the world to dip into those logs and provide better, um, you know, serviceability or, or patient care. This kind of goes into the second part of the question, the right to repair. And right to repair has been a big debate in the industry for God knows, you know, five, 10 years now. And um, it, it started more from a consumer iPhone perspective, but I think recently the medical device lobby has been working really hard as well 
to make sure that the uh, the healthcare providers or the ISOs, the experts out there, can maintain and manage these machines on their own as opposed to relying on OEMs all the time. And there are proven case studies, um, and I'll quote some numbers here. Um, you know, there's a large healthcare uh, provider on the East Coast. Uh, they save about $15 million every year because they are able to dip into these kind of different uh, programs internally and create value as opposed to relying on the OEMs. Uh, so I think the right to repair is absolutely a uh, logical sense that, you know, it should be given to the providers um, and, and uh, as opposed to relying on OEMs on their own. Excellent, excellent. All right, moving right along. Uh, what specifically are you doing with analytics to improve patient safety? Yeah, this is Brad. I'll take a first cut at that, and Paneet, feel free to, to hop in. Um, so patient safety for us, obviously, is a, is a big deal. Uh, and when we think about critical uh, equipment, whether it's building automation systems or imaging equipment, um, being able to supplement the data and the telemetry that we're gathering from all of our imaging equipment is incredibly helpful. So in some cases, I know more about the uh, equipment from the OEMs uh, than they do because I can actually supplement that data from um, our um, CTs, our MRIs, uh, with environmental data, such as uh, temperature, or such as utilization, or such as um, frequency of um, utilization coming from our command center in terms of how often patients are coming through. All of that data in, um, in aggregate actually paints a really, really awesome picture when you're trying to plan for things like readmission and skilled nursing utilization. And so um, we've been able to harness this data and add it as one of our data marks. Um, and it's, it's painted a pretty, uh, pretty awesome picture for us to be able to plan and forecast. Yeah, if I may add a couple of things uh, from, from Glassbeam analytics perspective, I would say two use cases. Uh, the first one is around dose analysis. Uh, we can we can provide dosage reports um, through again log analysis and other data types that we collect in our platform in the cloud, and that directly relates to how much radiation is being um, given to every patient, um, and that directly ties into the patient safety concerns. And the other one is uh, we also tap into the data coming again from the machine logs, where you can uh, proactively decipher if there's a you know uh, incorrect table movement or some other uh, thing happening to the machine, which may, uh, which could result into an uh, injury while the patient may be on the uh, on the MRI bed or the, or the CD scanner bed, and so those kind of proactive notifications can prevent certain patient uh, issues or patient, and, and improve patient safety. All right, excellent. Thank you, Brad and Puneet, for tag teaming that one. Uh, next one we got is a toss up beyond imaging. What other big data areas do you see as most promising now? Yeah, thank yeah, you. Me, I'm happy to go first from the hospital yeah. side of the house. Um, you know, big data for us, uh, to really boil down to practical terms, um, what are the things that could break um, that could impact patient care or quality of care? So um, similar to the previous question, um, starting to aggregate this with data and telemetry coming from building automation systems for uh, everybody on this call. I mean, these are the things that nobody cares about until they break, like the HVAC and the boilers and the chillers. How do you actually start to combine that data with the imaging equipment to start to articulate a different picture around patient comfort? So that's, that's one area where I actually think that um, not only is this going, in many cases, it's already gone. And um, just most systems haven't gotten around to figuring out how to partner with facilities uh, to, to track this data in a meaningful way. Um, Puneet, what did I, what else would you add? No, I think that's great. Um, I would just add the same same kind of theme that if you bring in data from a real-time location services around patient movement, if you bring in data from your uh, CMS system uh, as tickets are getting opened up, you know, all that data really adds to the definition of you know, the, the, uh, the big data. But, you know, what is big data? Big data is basically volume, uh, variety, and the velocity of different data types pouring into uh, one single location. Uh, so I think the more data you get beyond just the imaging machine logs, such as RTLS, CMS data, or other stuff that just Brad talked about, 
uh, I think those are the next frontiers that we are exploring right now at Plasky. All right. Uh, next one we got, can you speak more about drone deliveries? What are you delivering and what is the process of getting this set up? Yeah, great question. Um, I actually think you're going to start seeing this become more and more common uh, across the, the country. Um, this is happening outside of the U.S. Uh, in, um, in spades, um, primarily uh, brought to market during COVID. Um, the first use case um, for MultiCare will be the um, delivery of um, specialty meds, uh, analogous to what's already happening with things like Amazon Prime, um, et cetera. Uh, this is a really interesting um, area that, again, healthcare is going to be late to adopt. Uh, MultiCare um, has not been, uh, because we actually believe that uh, this is something that's a um, differentiator in the in the market. So if we can actually deliver a medication to someone's home um, in real time, as opposed to having them, you know, wait in line at a CVS, um, this is already happening um, through courier services today for uh, those that want a little bit more hospital at home or concierge medicine. Um, we think drones is just the next channel for uh, delivery in that space. All right, really exciting possibilities there. Uh, next question we have, does this tool sit within the provider cloud or does it require a transfer of information? And if the latter, what type of information has to flow from the provider to the third party? Yeah, yeah thanks for that information. I, go ahead, yeah, go ahead Puneet. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, let, let me just uh, provide a quick insight and, and uh, Brad, if you can jump in after that. Yeah, I think from a, from a tool or, or application or whatever you want to call that, uh, it is from a GlassMe perspective, the whole analytics is being done in the cloud. The only thing which is on-prem, which is uh, sitting uh, on the IT premises of healthcare provider, is a, a small virtual machine, which is called a, a, a gateway collector which is basically listening into uh, the, the, the data that is coming from the, uh, from the machine logs or, or could be DICOM data, DICOM headers, or HL7 traffic or whatever that might be. Um, so, so before we send anything to the cloud, we sanitize all that information uh, and we are extremely careful. We don't take any PHI or PII data today. Um, we, of course, you know, we, we signed a, you know, the BAAs as needed uh, but other than that, uh, every data element pouring into the cloud um, is uh, normalized in the cloud, analytics done all in the cloud, and you uh, get the access to the output through our dashboards through any interface. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Puneet. Um, to double down on that, that's actually one of the reasons that this um, platform is so attractive. Um, it doesn't require a ton of infrastructure for uh, multi-care, which, again, I'm not trying to be in the infrastructure game. Uh, and because it was literally plug and play, um, it allowed us to um, you know, take that capability and move it um, somewhere else. That's talent that, you know, again, we just don't have in house. So if we can leverage the Glassling platform to do that um, and give us results faster with higher level of quality, um, that seems like a really, really smart stewardship play. And that's, that's exactly what we've done. Excellent, excellent. Uh, next one we got. What is your perspective on the future operating model with regards to who leads medical equipment planning and facilities building planning? Does the CTO need to take the lead going forward or who is best to lead these efforts in the future? Yeah, I love this question. Uh, Stephen, thanks for asking this in the chat. I, I do think um, it's a yes and. Um, historically speaking, these teams uh, operate in silos, right? And, and when I say these teams, I'm talking, in this case, the imaging team, the facilities team, and IT. And so um, it's less about, in my mind, who, quote, unquote, leads it, as long as somebody is. And in this case, uh, it was really, really awesome to bring um, the parties to the table to say, this is a capability we don't have today. Because we are multi-care mixed fleet, we have um, – all sorts of, of uh, equipment. I wanted something that could actually talk to all the equipment, not just be looped in on Philips or only Siemens. So to find something that was a translator for all, like Glassbeam, um, allowed multi-care IT to have a different conversation with our uh, imaging team and our facilities team. So we went together 
Um, and it's been a really, really awesome success story to be able to articulate um, to our CEO council um, how this type of investment, when pursued as a team, gets a better outcome for the whole system. Right. Uh, next question, how does this assist in population health? Does MultiCare have a population health leader? Yeah, we do, and population health is one of our key um, strategies uh, at MultiCare. Um, when you think about pop health, it's a really, really broad topic, but to get really specific about this, because of our uh, ability to Panit's point earlier to um, forecast, map out inpatient utilization, ED, patient transfer, um, what is our skilled nursing utilization across the system? How do we think about readmissions? It, that total cost of care and reporting by utilization type plays right in with um, Glassbeam. So if one of our key pieces of equipment is down um, at two of our facilities, how do we actually partner with our mission coordination center on site to make sure that that patient doesn't have a bad experience and we can reroute and or know that that piece of equipment is not healthy and fix it before it breaks. And this, this has been a really, really awesome um, success story for us since we rolled it out uh, because we've been able to avoid um, unhappy patients and um, in the case of, of you know, some of our equipment most recently over in Eastern Washington, um, deploy the tech before it breaks and get the repair so that the patient had a seamless experience when they came on site. All right, we got time for uh, one, maybe two more questions. Um, moving right along, uh, you mentioned the role standards play in interoperability. Uh, our audience member wants to know, are you aware of foundational data standards for identifying devices like unique device identifiers and global medical device nomenclature codes and terms? Uh, audience member says these can assist with identifying recalled devices, tracking devices over time, and monitor routine maintenance. Yeah, I think from uh... From GlassMe perspective, uh, we have come across the UDI and other kind of uh, nomenclature in tracking machines or, or other kinds of uh, smaller devices. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the and, and therein lies one of the challenges that that's a very small subset of the of the machines or the devices that will conform to those standards. Uh, there are uh, there's a plethora of other unstructured. Uh, nomenclature which is sitting around and I'm, I'm not even going to the IP IP addresses are very simple uh, tagging information that we can get from any connected device in a, in a, in a healthcare setting in the, in, the, uh, in the in the internet but I think beyond that the uh, the, the whole notion of getting the logs which are totally um, unstructured logs because they are they don't fall in the particular formats uh, they sometimes they can be text-based sometimes they can be JSON XML uh, and I don't want to go uh, too much technical here, but I think we, we get the idea that uh, there's a lot of non-standard information sitting uh, in this environment, which uh, creates a bit of challenge, uh, and that's therein lies the opportunity for uh, analytics programs like Glassy. All right, thank you, Pranit. Uh We've got another one from Stephen here, likely the last question we'll have time for, but what is your perspective on medical equipment device ownership? Who should be the ultimate owners? Great. Was uh, Brad taking that? Brad, you might have uh, muted yourself in the middle of that answer. Um, yeah, so I think the if I understand the question, what's your perspective on medical? I'm reading the question here uh, from Stephen on the what's your perspective on medical equipment device ownership? Uh, I think from our perspective, the medical device, if I understand the question correctly, it's really the medical device who buys the medical device, owns the device. Maybe the question is probably more in the context of the data that medical equipment is generating. Who owns the data? Which I think we answered earlier. Uh, the, the data, of course, is owned by the, either the healthcare provider or the patient or the, uh, or the people who are responsible for servicing that equipment. Uh, they could be employees of the healthcare provider, they could be ISO organizations, or they could be uh, companies like Glassbeam who, uh, who get that data and then we can analyze that on behalf of the uh, institution. 
I hope I'm answering that question if I read that correctly. Thank you, Fanny. Um We will uh, just wait a short moment, make sure Brad doesn't come back on us. Yep, I'm back. Sorry for the sorry for the uh, for the drop there. All good. Did you want to take a stab at that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love the question, and I would just say philosophically, um, if IT is executing at the level that they should be in your organization, uh, the business won't care who owns it. So, uh, from a, an execution perspective, um, IT's job is to help enable. And if the medical equipment is stable and reliable, and you can actually show a payback period uh, on an investment like Glassbeam, um, no one will really care who owns it. So um, philosophically, we've just taken that stance, uh, and it's been an awesome success story um, as our um, my customers across the system are experiencing a level of support that they never have had before. And um, Glassbeam's been a huge part of that for us. All right, perfect. Well, uh, like I mentioned, that is all the time we have for today. I want to thank Brad and Panit for an excellent presentation and Glassbeam for sponsoring today's webinar. To learn more about the content presented today, please check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post-webinar survey. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.